Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know you were supposed to hear John's brother this morning. <laughs> That's a long story. But. That's okay. Just... <laughs> Has John's brother ever preached here? No. He's been going for the last three years, but he hasn't made it up yet. I knew Ray from way back. He's a great guy. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the second chapter of Matthew. I'm going to read the first 17 verses. I have a lot more scripture I'd like to read, but i got to let you out earlier. John won't feel good, so. Anyway, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 2. Verses 1. It's a very familiar scripture, but there's a meaning to it, and it's not about the birth of Christ, but there is a uh, lesson on the cure. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born a king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and had come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I may too, and go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by the other route. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so he got up and he took the child and his mother during the night and he left for Egypt. And there he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. The title of my lesson this morning, or my sermon rather, lesson might be, is what to do with this man called Jesus. In the book of Matthew, we find this question being asked even before Jesus was born. Mary and Joseph were not yet married, and when Joseph was visited by an angel, and he was told his wife to be, that was going to be pregnant and have a child. And Joshua, Joseph, rather, wanting to do the right thing, was going to put her away privately. This was the custom when an engaged girl got pregnant before marriage. But God told Joseph in a dream to take Mary as his wife and not know her until she had bought forth her firstborn son. We can only imagine Joseph's question, what do I do with this child called Jesus? As we continue to look at Jesus' life, we find a character named Herod the Great, as we just read in Scripture. Here was a king who certainly didn't know what to do with this child called Jesus. When he heard of the birth of this child, he called the chief priests and the scribes together, and he demanded to know, where is this child who is called king of the Jews? See, the Herod was threatened by this young child even before he was born. He just couldn't imagine some young king coming and taking over. And he was worried about it. And even though he didn't know him, he was upset about this young child that was supposed to be a king of the Jews. So then he encountered the wise men who studied the stars, and they asked him, he asked them, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star and are come to worship him. 
Herod, fearing this young child, asked the wise men to tell him where the child was. And if they found him, that God told them in a dream, do not tell Herod and to go home another way. And then when Herod found out, he was mocked by the wise men. He issued a decree to kill all the young children from two years and under. We can only imagine the horror and the grief of so many young children being murdered because Herod did not know what to do with this child called Jesus. It's hard for us to imagine a decree to stop think of in our own community to go uh, out through the land to kill all young men under the age of two babies. It's unbelievable. He was really threatened by this man called Jesus. When Jesus was 12 years old, he, his parents and them went to Jerusalem, as was the custom. And after being there a few days, they started home thinking that Jesus was following along with them and the other children. They had a great crowd. And after a day's journey, they could not find Jesus. Where was he? And so they turned back to Jerusalem to find this child. And so they looked for him. Sure enough, they found him sitting in the midst of scribes and scholars and and hearing all of them and asking many questions that he asked them, and all that they heard, they were astonished at what this 12-year-old boy knew, his understanding and his awareness of the scriptures, and the, the scholars could not understand how this young man could know so much. Mary then confronted her son, and she said, where have you been? We've been looking for you. And Jesus calmly answers, how is it you sought me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? Can you imagine hearing that from your 12-year-old son? I'm sure at this point that Mary and Joseph, as parents, were saying, what do we do with this boy called Jesus? After this incident, the scriptures fall silent about Jesus' ministry for 18 long years. I don't know if you ever thought about that or not. When I first found this statistic, it amazed me. We stopped thinking after 12 years and this happened, you don't hear nothing, hardly anything in the scriptures about Christ until he started his ministry at the age of 30. And of course we know that he preached for three years before his crucifixion. And I looked many, many times in the Bible and tried to find that timeline there. And there really isn't much about Jesus from age 12 to 30 uh, in his life. So there are two groups in Jesus' life that certainly couldn't answer this question, what do we do with this man called Jesus? For well, you see, Jesus went against a lot of what these very pious gentlemen stood for. He was always doing or saying something that did not fit their status quo, so to speak. He associated with people that would not, that they would not associate with. He was humble. He wasn't proud. They followed the law to the letter, and he had compassion. We talk about that word compassion a lot in our Sunday school class. In all the writings of the gospel, you find that Jesus had compassion passion upon people. Time and time again, when he looked out, he had that word, compassion. So as these people were prone to say, look what I did, and what I am, and, but Jesus was in their way. There was only one man, a Pharisee, who believed and asked Jesus many things about his ministry. He became an ally of Jesus. His name was Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night so as not to be seen by his constituents. He later stood up for Jesus, and all of Jesus' trial and tribulation, Nicodemus was one in a million. He stood beside him. All through Jesus' ministry, Jesus' disciples at times did not to do, know what to do with this man called Jesus. They were looking for a leader who would lead them against the dreaded Romans, a military leader who would solve all of their problems of oppression. If you remember the stories of the disciples, so many times they wanted Jesus to get on a white horse and let's go against them Romans. And that wasn't Jesus' way, was it? Jesus' was the way of kindness and offered repentance and love. And his main theme of his ministry was love, love one another. And the disciples couldn't understand that at times. Um, he would have them leave and they would come back and and he, he would be with them for just a short time. He tried to tell them, I'm not going to be here very long. You need to listen to what I'm saying. And we're going to try and change the world through love and compassion for one another. Peter had many problems with Jesus' teaching, but yet he loved the Lord with all his heart and soul. I'm going to get into Peter a little bit more a little later on. We're going to have to feel sorry for Jesus as he returned to his own country. 
and he was rejected by his own people. They did not believe that this carpenter's son could do all the wondrous things that he was doing. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Can you imagine going back to your own hometown and they won't have nothing to do with you? Uh, you just can't want, uh, imagine why. They even said, well, how could these words be coming out of a carpenter's son's mouth? Uh, they downgraded Jesus in his own hometown. Sometimes people say it's harder to preach at your home church than it is guest, or guest churches because they don't know you <laughs> like they do at your own home church. I don't know whether that's true or not. But anyway, so at the close of his ministry and his time was near to be crucified, Jesus was taken before the officials to be condemned and <coughs> crucified. And talk about a group of people who didn't know what to do with this man called Jesus. This group was the ultimate. They passed Jesus back and forth like a hot potato. He was first brought before Ananias, who then passed him on to Cephas, and then he then turned Jesus over to Pilate. Pilate, not wanting or knowing what to do with Jesus, sent him on to Herod, who promptly sent him back to Pilate. It seems this man's destiny was to figure out what to do with this man called Jesus. We give Pilate some credit for all he does try to release Jesus, but the Jews, Jesus' own people, demanded Jesus to be crucified. There again we find his own people hollering uh, for him to be crucified. Pilate tells his own people, that Jesus' own people, that he can find no fault in this man, but it made no difference. The people cried all the more louder that they wanted Jesus to be crucified. He offered them a crook instead of Jesus. And his name was Barabbas, of course, remember that. But they cried the more for Jesus' life. Pilate's own wife said she suffered a dream. She said, let this guy go. I suffered a, a many heartaches in my dreams, so let him go. But he would not do it. Pilate would not do it. Pilate gave in to the Jewish throngs, and he gave them Jesus, saying, I wash my hands of this man. I am innocent of his blood. It's the blood of a just person. See ye to it. And his own people said, Let his blood be upon me and our children. How sad. His own people. Peter is one of my favorite people in the Bible. He was bold. He threw caution to the wind. He would even challenge Jesus at times. But oh, how he loved his Lord. Who can forget Jesus walking on the water? toward the disciples on the boat, and Peter saying to the Lord, If it's really you, Lord, let me walk on the water. And no one old Peter, he jumped right out of the boat. Jesus said, Well, come on. And he jumped out of the boat and started walking. And you know how the story goes. He made three or four steps, and Jesus held out his hand, and he looked down, seen that nasty water, and his face went to put, and down he went. And Jesus, and how like that is in our life, instead of rejecting Peter, he held out his hand and said, come, and he grabbed him and pulled him up out of the water. Uh, but Peter was a great man. Uh, remember, uh, he was called the rock, and Jesus said, I will build my church upon you. So Peter was a great man, but he had fallacies for sure. Faint-hearted Peter was at that time. He faltered, his faith faltered, and he began to sink. Jesus chastised him for his lack of faith, but reached out and saved him. Peter was always telling Jesus that he would not let him down or forsake him. We know the story very well, but in Peter's darkest hour, he did not know what to do with this man called Jesus. He loved him, but yet he, he under duress, he denied him. Uh, he said, I do not know this man. And here he was, one of his chosen disciples. And he went so far as to say, I do not know him. And he did not once, but three times, as we recall. We talked about many different people in the Bible this morning who didn't know what to do with this man called Jesus. And we, there's many, many more instances of people that didn't know what to do exactly with this man, Jesus. But I now ask you this morning, each of you, what have you done with this man called Jesus? And you gave up your worldly ways? and followed him, or have you said, maybe later? Has he tugged at your heart to accept him or to do a work for him? And then you pass it off as just, I have a strange feeling. 
I'll get over it. All through the Bible, we are told to repent and live a life for Christ. It's really quite simple what to do with this man called Jesus. Accept him, let him come into your life. Not that. <laughs> and then live life, life that is pleasing unto Jesus. And to him, and how to do this? We do this by many different ways. We do it by coming to Sunday school. We do it by reading his word, studying his word, going to church, talking with other believers, loving Jesus and each other as he loved us. I asked you this morning, do you know this Jesus? Have you accepted him as your Lord and your Savior? If he were to return today, you know, if he come in here today, you wouldn't have a suit on. He'd come in with a long robe, beard worse than mine, and kind of scruffy with sandals, and would we accept him readily? We know that when he does come again, that every eye will see and every ear will hear, so we will know him. But if he come unannounced today, would we really know this Jesus? Would we accept him? Would we let him sit beside us and accept him wholeheartedly? I bet we would be a little bit skeptical, if the truth be known. So the point is today, are we ready? Are we ready for Jesus? Are you sure of your salvation today? Will you be in paradise with him today if he can? If you are not sure, now is the time to make that decision. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. I had a scripture that I read, I cut it out many years ago, from Billy Graham, he's one of my heroes in the our modern day world. He don't make the heaven, nobody's going to as far as I'm concerned. This is the daily Bible reading, and I cut it out because it's so uh, true the words that Billy read, wrote, excuse me. Ultimately, in one way or another, or at one time or another, we shall be faced with this question, what think ye of Christ? This is the apex of faith. This is the pinnacle of belief. This is where the faith of each must rest if he hopes for salvation. Christ is inescapable. You too must decide, what shall I do with this Christ? Amen.